Welcome to our fifth annual Library Con. I'm here with Sam Watfi. Sam Watfi is a comic book artist and co-creator of the mystery horror miniseries Last Stop on the Red Line from Dark Horse Comics. His work for DC Comics includes Superman, Flash, Harley Quinn, and Dr. Fate on titles such as DC's Superman, Man of Tomorrow, The Flash, Fastest Fan Alive, New Talent Showcase, and, and Scooby Apocalypse. He's also worked with Marvel Comics, Dynamite Comics, and IDW. Other projects include those in the gaming, film, and animation industries. Sam's work as an animator, character designer, and storyboard artist on titles such as DC Universe Online, Darksiders 2, and The Banner Saga. Sam, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Sam, how did you get into the comics industry? I started, uh, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, so I started there, you know, visiting my local comic shops. I, I noticed there was a publisher that was actually uh, a local publisher after I did a little bit of research called Antarctic Press, and they're still there. Um, and they basically focused on doing a lot of um, American American manga, which is a Japanese style of comics at that time. And they've grown out of that and do all kinds of different comics now. But I went and visited them uh, and they uh, took a look at my portfolio. Uh, this was back in, I want to say like... 2000 2001 something like that um and so wow i can't believe it's been almost 20 years <laughs> anyway <laughs> so they like my work enough to let me do some covers for their magazine that they're doing which is basically kind of like a monthly anthology of short stories uh, that i did a couple covers for and then soon after that uh, i had the opportunity to do some how to draw manga articles for them and did some uh, some of my own original comics as well a couple of issues of that i quickly moved into uh, animation after that and then once we Working in animation and video games, I realized you know where my real passion was. So I wanted to come back to comics, and uh, when I came back, I got uh, I submitted my portfolio to various publishers like IDW and and uh, Dynamite and places like that, and got some work doing some covers for them and some smaller stories. Uh, but it wasn't until I actually tried out for the DC talent search uh, for the art search that they had done. I don't know, that uh, start kind of up from there. I just submitted my portfolio. They had a pretty rigorous um, uh, contest that they put us through, and uh, once I went through that, uh, I was able to do some work for them and some other publishers along the way. That's great. Uh, yeah, we love your work. Uh, loved your work on the Flash. We've actually oh, got thank you. That. Not to make anyone jealous, but <laughs> we have some of that at our house. Oh, that's awesome! Thanks. <laughs> Um, so I noticed looking through your resume and listening to you talk that you've done a lot of work, not just in comics. So how important is it when you're an artist to be open to different working on different types of projects related to art? Honestly, you, uh, I mean, they, you say this about any kind of creative endeavor, right? You want to be as well-rounded as possible. So you're not necessarily just sticking yourself into a niche. I mean, finding a niche for yourself is important and that's good, but as far as your uh, creativity and your ability and your skills, you want to try, especially when you're first starting out, you want to try to uh, be as well-rounded as you can be. So not just, not just sequential art and comics, but everything from, if you can do animation, do animation. If you can do sculpture or 3d sculpture, you can do that painting, do that because all those other um all those other uh, styles and, and uh, mediums uh, inform one another right so your 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 sculpting informs you know your drawing informs your painting your painting informs your sculpting and then vice versa it's just a big cycle right um and and i use a lot of things that i learned in animation when i do any kind of action um or, or acting sequences in comic books i still use a lot of those principles and foundation uh things that i learned from animation when I do my comics. So it's definitely, uh, it definitely, they all inform each other. So I noticed that you're sitting in your studio. Um, what are your, some of your must have tool supplies or technology for creating? Okay, I'm gonna walk you through this. And since you're recording this, um, you guys can kind of rewind and write down some of this stuff later if you want. Um, so the first thing, it kind of depends on where I'm working. If I'm working at home in the studio, then I'll use more traditional tools like um, these are kind of dirty. I, I kind of I'm really bad about cleaning my tools, but <laughs> but I'll show you anyway. This is called a uh, it's a G pen nib. It's a zebra G pen nib. I don't know if I'm you can see that. Yes. There you go. Let me see if I can put my hand up behind it so you can get a better. There we go. You can see you can see how uh, well loved and used it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the the nice thing about these, uh, the reason I like these is because the nib itself, the, the point, will flex much like a quill pen will. 
and uh, it will give you various line varieties, everything from like a hairline to a nice fat wide line. So I use that, and it's all based on how much pressure you put on the tip. So those you can find online. Um, I also use traditional tools like you know, your brushes, inking brushes, and so forth. This is a Raphael uh, 8404 uh, series. So I recommend these. These are really good. Uh, now, the ink that I use for those, I also use, these are my go-to tools. Uh, I use uh, Speedball Super Black Indie Ink. You can find this at Hobby Lobby or any other local, you know, shops. Um, and then, of course, if I'm if I'm wanting to move a little bit faster now, when you use tools like a G pen or a brush, sometimes it can take a little while for the ink to dry. But if I'm wanting to or needing to move really quickly or make some quick corrections real quick, uh, I will use a brush pen. And this is a uh, Tombow. I'm going to butcher it because it's in Japanese. Uh, Fudenosuke brush pen, and it looks like that. And the tip of it is, uh, it looks like a felt tip pen almost. You kind of see that? But again, depending on how much pressure you put on the tip of it, you can get uh, line, you know, thick and thin lines with that as well. And then last but not least, we have uh, a Pentel brush pen. Now these just are just used refillable cartridges. It's a synthetic brush. Let me put my hand right, right there. There we go. It's got a nice point to it. And uh, you can just refill the cartridges and go. They're great for when you're at con actual conventions. Once the pandemic is over and we're back to going to conventions, well, <laughs> these are the tools you want to carry with you. Uh, you know, on a plane, you don't have to worry about that stuff exploding in the plane or anything like that. <laughs> and then, last but not least, for for uh, you know, uh, whiteout corrections and things like that, there's all kinds of uh, white pens and markers you can use. The one I tend to go to is a Uni Pasca. You can get these online as well. There you go. Those are my go-to tools for my making comics. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Um, so I'm assuming, of course, your schedule has probably changed since earlier this year. Um, yes. so if there is such a thing as a typical day for you uh, when you're working, what is that like? Typical day. Uh, I will usually try to get up early with the kids because my boys are usually up pretty early. Uh, I'll get up with them, you know, make sure they have their breakfast and so forth. And then I will every morning I have to have my tea. I'm a big tea drinker. So black tea is you know, what I like. Um, so I'll have my tea and then uh, I will usually more because if I'm working on a particular book, depending on where I'm at with the book, if I'm actually in the layout process versus where I'm actually where I'm drawing pages, um, you know, it, I will generally come into the studio and I will um, work on layouts until that's done. And and for those that don't know, layouts is basically kind of like a blueprint stage of, or storyboards of a comic book process. So usually, what we'll do when I'm working with the publishers, I will get a script from my editor. And then I will basically do rough storyboards or uh, blueprint drawings of what the comic page is going to look like. And they're very crude drawings. And let me see. I think I've got some right here. Okay. So they're pretty crude drawings. So like this is for a book I did uh, of Lark's Killer for another publisher. But you can see how rough the drawings are. They're not very... I'm basically indicating, this is the splash page, I'm indicating where the characters are, their gestures, the where, where the word balloon placement's going to be, and, uh, you know, kind of general attitudes and any kind of lighting source and things like that. And that's kind of where I'll, when I'm working on them there, and if there's any other kind of previous panels in any of the pages, I'll work on that. Now, while I'm doing this, this is where all the storytelling is done on a page. So, when I'm usually doing the layouts for a book, I'm not listening to anything other than just either music or just complete silence in the studio, because that's where a lot of the thinking power, <laughs> thinking power is going. So I can't be listening to a podcast or have a movie on in the background or something like that. So usually I'll do that, and then once those you know, once those are done, and I'm able to just focus on just actually rendering, penciling, and inking pages, uh, that's when I can kind of uh, uh, basically put it into cruise control. And I can pop on a podcast or listen to, you know, have a conversation with a friend while I'm drawing or put on a movie or something in the background. Uh, and I'll usually work until about 
five five thirty, and then you know, since I'm home, I don't have to drive anywhere. Uh, <laughs> then we'll have uh, dinner with the family, and and uh, the one thing that most people are. I don't know if some people are or not aware of this, but for comic book artists, especially for freelance comic book artists, your days are usually kind of long. So it can be, you know, you can you, you can work your eight to five or nine to five, but then sometimes, usually in my case, um, I pencil and ink all my own pages. So sometimes it can be anywhere. It can take anywhere between. 10 to 14 hours per page. So give or take. So usually I'll try to get the bulk of the page done in the day if I can. If I can't after dinner and I put, you know, put the kids to bed, I'll usually come back into the studio for a couple hours and just finish up the page. So page a day is what I usually try to crank out to kind of stay on pace with uh, the demands of a monthly schedule and things like that. <laughs> um, so about how long would it take to do a full issue? Full issue. Uh, generally, publishers plan ahead with stuff like this. So, like a full issue, standard full issue now is about twenty pages. So, um, you you will and and of course you have to at least try to do a page a day in order to stay on. Like I was saying, stay on uh, track. Um, usually, the editors will give you anywhere from anywhere from four, maybe even five or six weeks. It just depends on what the, the the schedule is. You might get a call from an editor and be like, I need you to fill in, do a fill in. We need it in three weeks or four weeks or whatever, or sometimes it's even shorter than that. Uh, but that's, that's, that's not as, that's not as common as you think. Uh, but then other times you have, you know, if you're doing, uh, especially if you're doing a creator own project, like I was working on with, with Paul at Dark Horse, um, you can take anywhere between five and six weeks to draw an issue. You know? um, but you, know, you, you go at your own pace. You, the, the most important, thing is that you communicate with your editor of the team that you're working with um how you know be realistic about how long it takes you to draw a page and how when you can deliver a page and things like that and if you think you're going to be late the best piece of advice i give everyone is if you think you're going to be late even if you're not 100 percent sure just let them know it might be late that way they have some sort of they, they know what's going on what's coming down the pipeline that you might be late and if you're on time that's great but if if you are late that way they're not not you know emailing you or calling you where are those pages things like that. So it's good to communicate. Yes. Um, do you remember um, the first comic you ever read? Yes. Uh, it was a Donald Duck comic book that I got. Uh, this is a very early memory. It's burned into my brain. Uh, it was a Donald Duck comic book that I got off a of spinner rack at like a 7-Eleven with my dad at a, some gas station. And right next to it, I saw, uh, it was either an X-Men issue or a Wolverine issue on the cover. And I was like, the very next week, I was like, I'm coming back to get the Wolverine comic. <laughs> I was like, Donald is nice, but <laughs> I want the Wolverine. <laughs> uh, were you drawing back then? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been one of just kind of like a natural drawer. I've been drawing ever since I could hold the pencil. So I think as early as, one and a half or two years old. I've just been doodling and just drawing all the time. Um, so what, uh, or who are some of the artists or authors who have inspired your work? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> off the top of my head, honestly, some of the artists and creators that have influenced most of my work, and you may not necessarily see it in the artwork itself, but, um, Growing up, it was, you know, the, the early Walt Disney classic movies like, you know, Snow White, Pinocchio, Bambi, um, uh, Sleeping Beauty, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, comics wise, like I said, the Disney comics like the Donald Duck and the Uncle Scrooge, Scrooge McDuck and all that stuff. But then, like, I so uh, soon after that, it was things like, you know, when I was in middle school, high school, was a lot of Japanese manga. Um, uh, Katsuhiro Otomo, like who did uh, Akira, and a whole bunch of other uh, Japanese comics, really, really influenced my, me at that time. And then, of course, a lot of French artists like Denis Bodart and various different French comic books, uh, Mobius and things like that, uh, really made a big impact. Uh, and then, uh, and then other classic illustrators like uh, J.C. Leyendecker. Um, and I'm blanking on his name right now, and I'm, I feel horrible because he's one of my favorites. I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Uh, but he did a lot of the classic Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan illustrations at the time. Um, and I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but well, for, uh, I'm sure you can look him up if you look up the classic illustrators of that time period, like early, early to, uh, 20th century illustrators. That stuff had a lot of influence on me as well. Do you have a favorite project that you've worked on? Mm. 
doing the Flash and Superman project, the b- stories were a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoyed doing that because uh, they're you know iconic characters. Um, one of the stories that I did that is not a superhero story. Uh, it is not necessarily an all ages story. It's a, uh, it was a short story I did for a Halloween special for uh, Ash versus the Army of Darkness. And uh, I, I'm a fan of those movies and those comics, but I got to do this really a short eight page story where it was a very simple premise about these high school kids going to, you know, sneaking into a graveyard to, to get drunk. And of course, zombies show up somehow and Ash shows up to save the day. That's, that's the basic premise of the story. But it was a really fun script and the, and the editor just kind of gave me the note of like, just have fun, just do whatever you want to do. You can make up whatever you want design-wise and things like that. So it was, uh, it was one of the first times when I worked with another publisher that was on something that wasn't creator-owned that I had a lot of freedom and a lot of elbow room to just do what I wanted. And uh, I'm really proud of those pages. So, I mean, I, I'm, I had a lot of fun on that. And, uh, and of course, working on uh, Last Stop on the Red Line, being, you know, on a co-created project like that was a lot of fun as well. Do you prefer to work on projects that uh, are your own original creations? Absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I like uh, working on working with other properties as well. Uh, it, it's fun to play in a sandbox with other people's toys for a little bit. But uh, ultimately, I feel like where I have the most creative fun, the most, uh, you know, free elbow room, if you will, is when I'm just kind of creating something from whole cloth, you know, whether I'm working with a, with a writer or if I'm just working on something on my own. Um, so what is some of the best career advice you've received? Stick your guns. That was uh, some advice I got uh, when I was at the DC camp. Uh, uh, Klaus Jansen and uh, Andy Kubert both were the instructors at the time over there. And those were those are some words that I've always heard that growing up and everything. You know, just you know when you know what you do, what you're doing, and and yes, you need to learn. Yes, you need to keep an open mind and be receptive, but you also need to trust your gut. And so the, the advice I kept hearing growing up all the time was, you know, you got to trust your gut, trust your gut. And then, of course, when I got to D.C. and everything, you know, the other variation of that is stick to your guns, you know. Um, and that's not to say that you need to be bullheaded about things. Uh, no, but of course, if you know what you're doing and you're confident in what you're doing, then then go ahead and stick to your guns. Don't compromise on something. If you have an artistic vision for something, don't compromise that. Uh, and, 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 of course, when you're working, and that's a little harder to do, when you're working with them with a creative team, you know, when you're on your own and you're working with a writer and another editor and they're asking for changes, you kind of want to pick your battles and things like that, you know, just focus on the things that are most important to you, communicate clearly what those, what those important things are and try to stick to those things as best you can. And then a little minor things along the way, especially when you're co-creating something or working with a team, you know, like I said, pick your battles. If it's something minor, let it go. But if it's something important, just make sure that you, Clearly communicate that and try to stick to your guns. So what advice do you have uh, for younger people who are just starting out and are interested in this type of work? Draw every day, um, paint every day, sculpt every day, like just try to do something creative every day. Write a story, even if it's a short story about you taking a walk to the mailbox and coming back. Uh, and th- whatever happened along the way between there and back, um, just to be, do something creative, make something creative every day if you can, because it's going, it's the, all you're going to do is just get better the more you do it. And as far as comics go, if there, if any younger people are wanting to get specifically into drawing comic books, um, the best thing in the, the best advice I can give them is to start drawing comics now. You don't need you don't need a degree. You don't need permission. You can just start take a piece of paper, or you can do it digitally. Whatever however you com- you're however comfortable working, and um, draw your panels. Tell a story from beginning to end, and and don't try to do an entire graphic novel at first. Maybe just try to do a one page story uh, with three to five panels, or and then from there you can graduate up to doing a three page story, and then a five page, an eight page, a ten page, and then of course. You can go up to 20 pages, which is a full issue, standard issue. Uh, and then for, and it's, so you just kind of take it little by little baby steps along the way and, and see if you can start and finish an entire story within a three, three page uh, limit or a five page limit, things like that. So that, and that will help you discipline yourself on um, 
basically telling a story within the time frame that you have, but also figuring out where the beginning of the story is, where the middle and the end is, and cutting out anything that's not necessary, right? Especially on the shorter stories. You, you just have to stick to your main point to the story and try to make it as entertaining as you can along the way. Is there anything that you really um, don't like drawing or something that took you a long time to get the hang of drawing? <laughs> um, bicycles. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they are very geometrically, you know, difficult and challenging. Like, you know, a motorcycle is one thing because you can you can you can cover up a lot on a motorcycle, but with bicycles, for some reason, there's nothing you can cover up. It is just it's all it's literally just bare, bare bones, and all the spokes and everything. It's it. I could never draw bicycles for the longest time. And eventually, I finally started really paying attention and really I was like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to draw bicycles, and uh, figured it out eventually. But I still don't enjoy drawing bicycles. So anytime I see something like that written into a script, I'm like, can we just have? Them doing something else or just <laughs> jogging. How about if they're jogging? They don't need a bicycle. <laughs> um, so I know sometimes when I ask artists this question, they have to keep projects they're working on a secret, but okay. anything that you're working on right now or that's coming up that you can tell us about? Um, well, one thing I can tell you about, it's, I've already worked on it. Uh, it's part of a anthology of short stories. Uh, it's a collection that was done on Kickstarter called uh, Rum Row. And it's written by Andrew Maxwell. And Rum Row is kind of like a um, early, uh, it's kind of like steampunk meets 1920s Prohibition era. So it's kind of like a crime story, uh, you know, and the anthology itself is going to be coming out soon. I'm not sure. Unfortunately, I don't know exactly when, but they're still working on getting the last bits of it put together. But I did a short story for that um, that will be coming out whenever the anthology is released. Um, and uh, I'm currently working and writing and illustrating uh, – a project of my own that I'm actually going to be writing and drawing myself. So um, that I can't tell you too much about other than it's going to be a science fiction fantasy adventure story, uh, kind of like a coming of age story uh, about a young man who sets out on an adventure and uh, finds out learns a lot of life lessons along the way. Um, but that's about all I can say about that for right now. <laughs> well, that is awesome. We will look, we'll be on the lookout for that. Um, so right now we're going to switch over to a drawing demo that Sam recorded for us. Um, so for those who want to follow along, can you tell us what you're going to be going over and maybe some supplies that they would need to have handy if they want to follow along? Sure. Um, what I'm going to be going over is basically a comics 101, uh, introduction and overview of what, um, kind of introducing you what comic books is and um, and also how to go, you know, my process in going about drawing a page and, and, you know, understanding panel to panel work and things like that. So all you really need to follow along is just a pencil or pen and a, and a couple of sheets of paper. And that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for joining us. Um, hopefully we can have you out at the library uh, when we're back to hosting our con here. Would love to visit sometime, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys, it's Sam. We're going to go over Comics 101, an introduction and overview of the process and what comics and sequential art is. Now, one of the reasons I love comic books is that it's not just a... not They're not just used for entertainment, and they're not just used to tell stories, but if you think about it, comics are a language, right? So... Here's some examples that I'm talking about. So, for example, if you go back to ancient Egypt, we look at the hieroglyphs. They used, if you think about it, they were basically a series of sequ uh, images in sequence, right? So, sequential art is comics. So, the ancient Egyptians used images in sequence to convey and communicate through a language uh, information, ideas, their beliefs, and tell a story, and so on and so forth. So that's one way that comics is kind of is a language. Another way it's a language to communicate ideas and information is if you've ever put anything together, any kind of furniture together, you have an instruction manual. You're gonna get, you know, you go through the steps and it tells you, you know, where to take the screws, where to put which, you know, which where to put the screws, and so on and so forth. And then of course the obvious one, yes, comic books are used for stories with popular characters like this guy. And then of course, comics is also a medium, not just a genre, 
and not just about superheroes, but it's about any subject. Not a single genre, like superheroes, but many genres. You can t use comic books to tell any kind of story that you'd like. You can tell stories, you can tell horror stories or spooky stories, you can tell uh, uh, sport, sports stories, you can tell stories about cooking or food. Can you tell I'm a fan of sushi? And then of course you can have your romance and love stories or a good mystery or thriller and any other kind of story you can imagine. That's what's so great about comics is you can expand them to tell any kind of story you want. Now the next part I want to go over with you guys is panel to panel work. Now what are panels? Panels are the boxes that you see on a comic book page. Each one of these boxes or panels is basically equals a moment in time, a specific moment in time. That moment in time can be short or it can be long or somewhere in the middle. In this sequence here we have a bouncing ball. Now you can see in the first panel here is a single image of a ball in the air and we have the shadow. The light is coming from above and so it casts a shadow on the ground here. The next panel we have the ball on the ground where gravity is pulling it down towards the ground. Now you'll notice that I used, uh, when I was talking about uh, my background in animation, this is one of the things that we learned in animation. It's one of, the, one of the principles of animation is squash and stretch. So if you've ever watched a basketball or a dodgeball bounce in slow motion, you'll notice that when it hits the ground, it will squash just a little bit with the force bringing it down before it bounces away. Now on this third panel here, I've drawn it basically going out of the panel frame in order to show that the ball is actually moving in a direction other than just back up again. And it's also not at the same height that it originally was, because each time it bounces, it loses some of that energy, and so it's not quite as high as it was initially. And of course, just for fun, to kind of give, just to give you a, a, an indication that of the energy or the spark of where it hit the ground or contact with the ground, I drew a little top half of a star there, just to kind of give you a little boom as it got out, goes out that way. Now, the space between these panels are called panel borders, or you can call them gutters. And then of course, this is where, what's really cool about the, the space between these panel borders, and this is important, how thick or thin these panel borders are also helps convey time. If they're really, really wide spaces, it means that there's lots of time happening between these panels. If they're fairly narrow like this, it means that it's a very short amount of time happening between the panels. And here, the reason I wrote Imagination and Magic is because these are just static images. What's making this ball move and bounce from here to here and out the frame is our imagination. And that's really where the magic happens, is right in between these panels. We fill in the rest of the information from the ball coming down and bouncing out of frame. So this is a sequence of three images where it shows a bouncing ball. Now, this time frame takes about, I would guess, maybe like a one second for a ball to bounce down. One Mississippi. It's a very short time frame that we use three panels to show. Now, another way that we can show time using three panels differently is like this. Now here we have the same three panels that we had with the bouncing ball, except we're showing time pass in a much slower way, right? Now a ball bouncing takes, like I said earlier, about a second, give or take, but a tree growing to its full length is, can take anywhere, depending on the type of tree and conditions and environment, can take anywhere between 10 and 30 years. So here we're using the exact same three panels to show years passing by versus a single second passing by. So that's one of the really cool things about uh, sequential art and in comics is you can use those panels to show time passing very slowly or you can show it passing very quickly. Now what I want to talk to you guys about next is how we can use a sequence of images, juxtapose them in a particular way to tell a story. So earlier we looked at the bouncing ball and it was a sequence of images that showed you a ball bouncing. Or we should looked at a set of three panels that showed a tree growing. That's not really a story, it's just conveying information or communicating an idea, right? Well, now we're going to look at how we're going to tell a story. So what, I'm going to look, what we've got here in this first panel is our little bee character who's very, very happy about something. The next panel that I'm going to show you, and I'm not going to show you this in any particular order, we're just going to show you down here we've got He's no longer really, really uh, happy anymore. He's pretty upset. We're going to find out why in a little bit. Then I'm going to show you this ice cream cone right here. And then, of course, a splattered ice cream cone on the ground. So, 
when I show you, now, uh, standing alone, these things by themselves are just images. They don't really mean anything. They don't really tell a story. But if I show you these images in a particular order, now, now we've got a story, and we also have something that we can all relate to and connect with. I mean, who hasn't really dropped their ice cream cone, right? So here we go. So the first panel, we have our B character. He's very excited and happy. Panel two, he's looking at an ice cream cone. It looks delicious. Next panel, splat. And then, of course, finally, we see his reaction. And I'd feel the same way. So we can see that these images by themselves don't really tell the story, but when we juxtapose them together, when we look at them in this particular order, they now tell a story, and one that most people can, can connect with, right? You want your readership and your audience to connect with that story. So you want to tell stories that people can relate to. So now I want to talk to you guys about panel and page flow. Now this is where all of the actual storytelling and nuts and bolts come together when you're telling a story in sequence. And it's very important for the reading experience, right? So for example, here we have on our left an even number page and on our right an odd number page. So when we start with our panels, we always want to go in the order that we read, right? So top to bottom, left to right. So we're here on this even number page, we have panel one, two, three, and four panel 5 and 6, and then as we move on to the next page, panel 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you can see these red arrows kind of directing the eye across and how we flow through the page. Now you'll notice some panels are smaller and some panels are bigger. You always want to have the most important information of that scene in the biggest panel so that the reader understands that this is important. We need to really focus on this. Whether that information is something that's technical or it might be a scene where somebody is pulling out a piece of technology that's really, really important, or it could be King Arthur with Excalibur, or it could just be a letter that somebody received, a message or a text message that somebody received, and it's very, very important information. Or it could just be a really emotional scene. Somebody's really excited or someone might be really sad. Something tragic might have happened. These are, the, these are the panels where you want to put these bigger, important pieces of information. Now, I have them here at the bottom of the page. The reason for that is because on an even-numbered page, you, don't, you can put the largest panel over here at the top if it calls for that. But you also don't want to give it away right away. You kind of want to build to that bigger moment. And so the reason we have, uh, I'm specifying between even and odd-numbered pages, is that you want to put anything that you're revealing on an even number page. The reason for that is because when you're flipping through a comic book, if it's on an odd number page, they're gonna eat they, they may not necessarily be looking for it, but they might just see it out of their peripheral and it might get spoiled. If it's on an even number page, it's gonna be on the back side here and they won't see it coming. And so they'll be surprised. And you always want to put any kind of setup or anticipation scene into which is uh, on an odd number page. It's a good place for cliffhangers. And then of course if you have a cliffhanger here or any kind of setup or anticipation, what's going to happen next, what's behind that door, when they turn the page, they'll get the reveal of actually, or the resolution of what actually happened here. And that way you can avoid spoilers. And this is really important when it comes to keeping the reader turning the pages. So what we're going to talk about next is the layout process. Now, I was talking about this earlier uh, as well. Now, the layouts is where, we bas where I basically do the storyboards, if you will, or the blueprint uh, of what the story is going to be. This is the most important part of the storytelling. This is where I will work out what's happening in the story, how big the panels are, how big the characters are in each panel, where my camera angles are going to be. The other most important thing that you want to remember when you're doing your layouts is you also want to also make sure you have you're making room for the word balloons because after all you might have a really cool image or a really cool shot or moment or camera angle but if you can't if there's no space for the word balloon what's going to happen is that the letterer is just going to take that that uh, word balloon and place it right over your really cool drawn characters over here because that word balloon needs to go in there so you always want to make sure you're making room for these word balloons as you're also composing your shots and telling the story. So this particular layout page is from a um, backup story I did for Secret Squirrel. It's in the uh, backup for uh, Scooby Apocalypse number 25 for DC Comics. 
And this is one I really enjoy because it kind of it really conveys um, all different kinds of angles and different kinds of storytelling within a single page. So I'm just going to go over this here with you real quick. So in this moment, I'll just set up the scene for you here. This is the cliffhanger page uh, for this particular story. Uh, are the the evil villain basically? Uh, directs the surgical robot that comes out here to come out and uh, work on and operate on our heroes here. We have Secret Squirrel and his friends and of course the goons are tying them up to some chairs here and of course the, the evil villain is directing this robot here and saying his little line of dialogue and monologuing and so forth. Now the reason here I've introduced this robot but we don't really see him very well. He's mostly dark because we don't want to I don't want to give that away quite yet. So he comes out as mostly silhouette and shadows. And then of course here we're establishing that the the scene of where everybody is in place. And of course we have the villain, the goons and the robot and the characters, the main characters are tied up in this chair here. And I've left a lot of space between them so that we can have these word balloons here. Now this robot is here to basically remove their brains and put them in these jars because this evil villain is basically stealing everybody's brains. And of course Here's one of the goons carrying the jars. So we're showing uh, information that this is where the brains are going to go in the end. So it's kind of kind of a fun, goofy, but also <laughs> creepy, uh, uh, you know, plan that this villain has here. Now here in this next panel is where we actually reveal the robot, the surgical robot, and he has all different kinds of surgical, dangerously sharp surgical tools as he comes forward, and we're dr dramatically lighting him from underneath and so on and so forth. And at the very end, here's the cliffhanger shot of uh, Secret Squirrel and his friends tied up to his chairs. And as, as we get, as we flip the camera from here to here and show this dangerous buzzsaw and this uh, scalpel coming towards them. And of course, he's <laughs> screaming for help here. And that's kind of how the dramatic ending is. Now, this is where I want to make sure that all the storytelling is solid, because if it doesn't work out here, no matter how pretty I draw these pictures, the story is going to be confusing and unclear. Now, I'm going to show you the finished page. And here we have the same thing. And I'll even put them side by side here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So here we have panel one. Now the reason this is bigger is because I draw on 11 by 17 Bristol board. And what I'll usually do is I will draw this on eight and a half by 11 paper. And I will take this layout and in Photoshop, I'll enlarge it, scale it up and blow it up onto an 11 by 17 Bristol board. I'll print this out on an oversized printer and then I can draw right over those uh, layout drawings ahead with some more detail and so on and so forth. We can see Secret Squirrel and his friends being tied up by some goons here. And then of course, we have the establishing shot where everybody's sitting and so on and so forth. So we know what's going on in the environment. Then we have the goon carrying the device where the, the, where the brains are gonna end up. And then of course here we have the introduction of the surgical robot. Now you'll notice here between these two panels, here I have him contained inside the box. Here I have the robot breaking some of these panel borders. Now the reason I did that is because I wanted it to, be, to kind of really give it that dynamic uh, sense of danger. Like if this robot's really coming towards you and he's really getting ready to do some surgery on you that's that's uh, unwanted. Uh, so to kind of show that real danger and of course the dramatic lighting from underneath and so forth. You, When you do break the panel borders you want to be really careful where you do that. You want to do that sparingly because if you do it too much you're going to break up the reading flow of the page and you might confuse your readers on which panel to go to next. And of course, last but not least, we have our final dramatic cliffhanger shot of Secret Squirrel and Friends under the knife. And will they make it or won't they? You'll have to read the next issue to find out. And there you go, guys.